Section 1. A man wants to find out about a language course. Listen to the conversation between the man and the woman and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Good morning, University Language Centre. How can I help you? I'm interested in doing a language course. I did Mandarin last year, and now I'd like to do Japanese. Can you give me some information about what courses are available at your centre, and when they start, that sort of thing? Yes, certainly. Well, we actually offer a number of courses in Japanese at different levels. Are you looking for full-time or part-time? Oh, I couldn't manage full-time as I work every day, but evenings would be fine and certainly preferable to weekends. Well, we don't offer courses at the weekend anyway, but let me run through your options. We have a 12-week intensive course, three hours, three nights a week. That's our crash course. Or an eight-month course, two nights a week. I think the crash course would suit me best, as I'll be leaving for Japan in six months' time. Are you a beginner? Not a complete beginner, no. Well, we offer the courses at three levels. Beginners, lower intermediate and upper intermediate, though we don't always run them all. It depends very much on demand. I'd probably be at the lower intermediate level, as I did some Japanese at school, but that was ages ago. Right. Well, the next Level 2 course begins on Monday the 12th of September. There are still some places on that one. Otherwise, you'd have to wait until January or March. No, I prefer the next course. The woman asks the man for some details about himself. Look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 5 to 10. Right. Can I get some details from you then, so I can send you some information? Sure. What's your name? A family name first. Haggerty. Richard. H-A-G-A-R-T-Y? Uh, no. H-A-G-E-R-T-Y. Oh, okay. And your address, Richard? Well, perhaps you could email it to me. Right. What's your email address? It's ricky45, uh, that's one word, r-i-c-k-y-4-5, at hotmail.com. And I just need some other information for our statistics. This helps us offer the best possible courses and draw up a profile of our students. Fine. What's your date of birth? I was born on the 29th of February, 1980. 1980? So you're a leap year baby. That's unusual. Yes, it is. And just one or two other questions for our market research, if you don't mind. No, that's fine. What are your main reasons for studying Japanese? Business, travel or general interest? My company is sending me to Japan for two years. All right, I'll put down business. And do you have any specific needs? Will there be an emphasis on written language? For instance, will you need to know how to write business letters, that sort of thing? 
No, but I will need to be able to communicate with people on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, so I'll put down conversation. Yes, because I already know something about the writing system at an elementary level, and I don't anticipate having to read too much. You said you'd studied some Japanese. Where did you study? Three years at school. Uh, then I gave it up, so I've forgotten a fair bit. You know how it is with languages if you don't have the chance to use them. Yes, but I'm sure it will all come back to you once you get going again. Now, once we receive your enrolment form, we'll contact you. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Test 2, section 2. You will hear a man talking on the radio about dogs which help people with their work. First, look at questions 11 and 12. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 11 and 12. Welcome to this week's edition of Countrywide. And today, we're taking a look at a number of different breeds of working dogs. And here to report on the dogs with jobs is Kevin Thornhill. Thanks, Joanne. Well, yes, dogs with jobs is the subject of today's program. Dogs have earned themselves a reputation over the centuries for being extremely loyal. And here's a little story which illustrates just how loyal they are. Just outside the country town of Gundagai in Australia is a statue built to commemorate a dog a dog which sat waiting for his owner to return to the spot where he'd left him. Well, the story, which was immortalised in a song, has it that the poor dog died waiting for his master, five miles from Gundagai, which is where they built the statue. Now that's what I call loyalty. Now look at questions 13 to 20. As the talk continues, complete the table for questions 13 to 20. Well, because of their loyalty and also their ability to learn practical skills, dogs can be trained to do a number of very valuable jobs. Perhaps the most well-known of working dogs is the Border Collie Sheepdog. Sheepdogs which work in unison with their masters need to be smart and obedient, with a natural ability to herd sheep. Some farmers say that their dogs are so smart that they not only herd sheep, they can count them too. Another much-loved working dog is the guide dog, trained to work with the blind. Guide dogs, usually Labradors, need to be confident enough to lead their owner through traffic and crowds, but they must also be of a gentle nature. It costs a great deal of money to train a dog for this very valuable work, 
But the guide dog associations in the UK, America and Australia receive no government assistance, so all the money comes from donations. Another common breed of work dog is the German Shepherd. German Shepherds make excellent guard dogs and are also very appropriate as search and rescue dogs, working in disaster zones after earthquakes and avalanches. These dogs must be tough and courageous to cope with the arduous conditions of their work, and so that they can be sent anywhere in the world to assist in disaster relief operations, effective dogs and their trainers are now listed on an international database. When you arrive at an airport here, you may be greeted in the baggage hall by a detector dog wearing a little red coat bearing the words quarantine. These dogs are trained to sniff out fresh fruit as well as meat and even live animals hidden in people's bags. In order to be effective, a good detector dog must have an enormous food drive. In other words, they must really love their food. At Sydney Airport, where there are 10 detector dogs working full time, they stop about 80 people a month trying to bring illegal goods into the country. And according to their trainers, they very rarely get it wrong. Another famous working dog is the Husky. Huskies, which originally came from Siberia, have been used for decades as a means of transport on snow, particularly in Antarctica where they have played an important role. Huskies are well adapted to harsh conditions and they enjoy working in a team. But the Huskies have all left Antarctica now because the International Treaty prohibits their use in the territory as they are not native animals. Many people were sad to see the dogs leave Antarctica as they had been vital to the early expeditions and earned their place in history along with the explorers. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. You are going to listen to a conversation between two students about preparing a questionnaire as part of an essay assignment. First, look at questions 21 to 24. As you listen, answer the questions. 21 to 24. I've never written an essay of more than 1,500 words before, Anne. Me neither, Mark, and it scares me. Ah, I wouldn't worry. We'll just have to pretend it's four essays of 1,500 words and join them together. <laughs> it says here in the assignment notes Dr Brightwell gave us that we're to write between 5,000 and 6,000 words on some aspect of students' attitudes, backed up by our own research, which we present in the form of tables, graphs, charts or whatever, and supported by reference to the list of books she gave us. Oh, I didn't realise there had been so many social science books written about students. Oh, yeah, there are a lot. Mm. And the questionnaire? Yes. Um, we have to um, prepare a questionnaire to gather our own data for the graphs, etc., and hand it in to Dr Brightwell in draft form in um, two weeks' time. Two weeks? That's what she said, and what it says here. She says that it's better to have it checked before we go on to collect the information and start the writing. Mm, suppose she's right. We'd better get started then. But she didn't say how we were going to put the questionnaire together. Does it say anything in the notes? Uh, nope. It only says that we are limited to four sides of A4 and no more than 50 questions. Mm, mm. 
If that's the case, it's not that bad. Before the conversation continues, look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 25 to 30. For questions 25 to 30, match the points mentioned in the table to the speaker. Circle M for Mark or A for Anne. So, how are we going to do it? Well, first we need to know who we're aiming it at. Then decide how many questions we're going to ask. I think we could have about 40 questions maximum. I don't think there's any real need to go up to the 50 limit. Mm. And I think we should keep the questions themselves very simple. <laughs> don't worry. In my case, they will be. <laughs> <laughs> we could have a mixture of question types, like multiple choice questions. Yes, no, and agree, disagree, with boxes for people to tick. Mm -hmm. If people are asked to write down anything, it's unlikely they will fill it in. So, are we going to give this questionnaire out to people to hand in, or are we going to just stop and ask them around the campus or on the street? Mm, I don't really know. Did she say anything about this? Um, no, she didn't. And there is nothing in these notes she gave us either. I think we ought to give them out. OK. Anyway, it won't affect the way we design the questionnaire. We're both doing it on different subjects, but there's nothing wrong with pooling our ideas about the mechanism of the questionnaire. No, none. What are you doing your project on? I've been thinking about doing something around the subject of um, how aware students are of world affairs. People think that we're all up to date, but I very much doubt it. Hmm. It would also be interesting to compare students in different years. And you? I'm doing something on health and sport, and whether students are more or less active since they came to university. Oh, sounds interesting. As the questionnaires can be anonymous, I'll fill in your first questionnaire for you. <laughs> but I'm sure you won't be surprised by my answers. <laughs> Somehow. I don't think so. <laughs> I suggest we put together about 20 or 25 questions each and then meet tomorrow or the day after and compare them. Mm -hmm. Are you going to type yours up? Yeah, then I can come round to your place and we can work on them. You've got a laptop, haven't you? Yes, and I've got some new design software so we can play around with the layout. Brilliant. Are you any good at doing charts and things? I know how to do simple things on the computer, but we'll sort something out. OK. I feel much better about all this now. It doesn't seem quite as bad as I first thought. No, don't worry, we'll get it done. That's the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecture on life at work, which is being given as part of a series of lectures on productivity and work practices. First, look at questions 31 to 35.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 35. As you can see, there are four alternative answers, A, B, C and D, for each question. Decide which alternative is the most suitable answer and circle the correct letter. Good afternoon, my name is Dr Charles Butt and I shall be giving you a series of lectures on productivity and work practices over the coming weeks. There will be 10 lectures in the mornings as part of this course and in addition there will be three lectures in the evenings from 6 to 8 which will be given by outside speakers. I would like first to look at a recent report on life at work. The report shows that the average British worker takes less than half an hour for lunch, 27 minutes to be precise, and that sick leave is on the increase. The drop in the length of time spent on lunch was 9 minutes when compared to last year, down from 36 minutes. According to the report, this is the first time that the average lunch break has fallen below half an hour. As regards sick leave, you can see that the average figure is 10 days per year. That's up by one day in 2002 compared to 2001. While physical illness was given as the most common reason for absence in the case of non-manual workers, stress was the most common cause of long-term absence. It's worth noting here that 9 out of 10 workers claim that stress is a problem in their organisation and that 8 out of 10 bosses are feeling more stressed than ever before. I would just like to say here that we will be looking at the stress in work and study at a later date. And we'll be looking particularly at ways of dealing with it in studying, particularly for exams. You can see from the calendar that Professor Appleyard will be giving a lecture on this topic the week after next. The report also says that just below 50% of workers claim that they were taking less time off for holidays than they were entitled to. I'm not sure that this will be believed by the employers. Previous surveys have suggested that about one-third of days that have been taken by workers as days off sick were regarded by bosses as not being the result of genuine illness. Some more hard data is required to corroborate both these claims. Before the speaker continues, look at questions 36 to 40. As you listen, answer questions 36 to 40. All this suggests that employers are driving their workers too hard. The effects of overworking mean that workers are now being stretched beyond their limits, both physically and mentally. This is borne out by the increase in sick leave. However, looked at from the employer's point of view, the picture may not be the same. Employers say that workers protest too much, but bearing in mind the data about the number of bosses feeling much more stressed than before, we need to think about this carefully. It's interesting to note that productivity has gone up in many areas of industry. In 2001, the local car plant had one of the sharpest increases in average productivity, with the number of vehicles per employee rising by over 30% a year. A new assembly line came into operation at the beginning of 2002, affecting productivity, which increased to the 100 vehicles per worker mark by the end of the year. This is a stunning achievement for an industry which was not long ago considered to be collapsing. It would be interesting to do a survey of the work life at the plant. Those of you who have opted to do the project and reduce the number of essays you have to do may want to look into this. Please see me at the end of the lecture. 
Right, now, let us move on to something else which I think you'll... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.